We welcome everyone to this May 1st, 2023 meeting of the Corsica County ISD Board of Trustees. This is a board workshop and all items that will be discussed have been duly posted. While this is a meeting in public, it's not a meeting of the public. If you wish to speak, please register in the lobby on the audience for guest form and follow the information on the speaker form. The board's role is to set goals, approve personnel and budgets, make policy, and provide oversight. We are not here to manage or solve individual problems. Management is the responsibility of the superintendent. As a board, we believe that we must educate every child, provide every child the greatest opportunity to learn, and maintain a safe and secure environment mentally, physically, emotionally, and academically. And these are our core values. We appreciate your interest in the children of CISD. All right. I'm going to do an audience for guests. Ms. Harrison, okay. I do have some things I need to talk about. Did you sign up? I, I did. Yes. <laughs> yes, she did. <laughs> um, we have some very exciting announcements. Um, I'm going to start with... Um, just saying how very, very proud I am of Deshaun Lloyd, one of our high school students who qualified um, for the state track meet in two different areas um, re um, related to the hurdles. Um, the, um, he took second in the 300, and he won the 110-meter hurdle. So he'll be going to the state track meet. I think it's the 11th, 12th, and 13th in Austin. Uh, we're very, very proud of him. We're also proud of our softball team. They made it to the playoffs. Um, this year they fell short to Melissa, but we're just really proud that they made it um, into the playoffs. And I think um, things are really on the rise for our softball girls. We're proud of how they're playing. We're proud of our coaches. Our baseball team opens the playoffs this week with a series against McKinney North. The first game is here Thursday night. The second game is at 7 o'clock. The, the second game is 7 o'clock at, at um, I'm sorry. The first game is here. The second game is at McKinney North. And if we need a third game, it's 2 o'clock on Saturday at Rockville High. Coach, did I say that right? Okay, great. Um, speaking of different honors, um, we have four of our Corsicana Middle School leaders who are headed to Harvard this summer. We are very proud of them and appreciative of HEB, um, who is sponsoring them. Um, our leaders are Brad Thomason, Dr. Karen Kopp, Lauren Gist, and last year's, um, one of the, our Teachers of the Year, Audrey Marks. They were chosen by the Charles Butt Foundation. And they will be at Harvard this summer for a week, um, learning different leadership um, skills and um, in the Raising Leaders program. So this is this is really a big deal. I got to do this when um, many years ago, and it was one of those things that um, changed my life, the way I viewed education, and certainly um, strengthened my leadership skills. So it, it's a really wonderful opportunity, and we thank our friends at HEB. Even more, we thank our friends at HEB for um, choosing Corsicana ISD as one of the um, award winners. Um, as one of the award winners last night, Corsicana ISD is the small district um, of the year. And we had just a, a great evening. They celebrate public education, and there are over um, 40,000 entries into the different levels. There are, there are teachers, there are school districts, there are early learning centers, there are principals who are recognized. And I um, could not be prouder of our district and our students. And there is a video that they did that I want to ask um, Raymond, Adam, if you'll start. Adam, thank you. is very diverse. Our school our district, school district looks, looks a lot like, like, our, like our community. community. We're, We're a majority, a majority of Hispanic, of Hispanic and we embrace and love all of our students and all of our cultures and we're just proud of everybody who is here who has chosen for Sienna ISD. Many of our students um, have, different um, have different challenges, and so what we, and so what try, we to try to do is, is limit our class sizes as, as much as we possibly can, can. and if and there's, there's something that we can provide, we contact, we contact the student, and, we'll and then we'll get with the families and say, and say how, can how, can family? family? how can we support your family, how can we support your students' learning. We have to have a great family situation and the family's needs being met so that our students come to school ready to learn. 
however, however the school district goes, goes affects our, our county, county. We, take we take a huge responsibility. We talk about TCC, we talk about TCC. And, TCC and TCC means take care of Corsicana. It absolutely applies to the school district and how we treat each other, how we treat other people, but it also applies to what we see and what we want to build in our city. Corsicana ISD really is about the community and Corsicana as a whole. I think that there are so many different groups outside in the Vera County, here in Corsicana, that we work with directly. We have direct partnerships with arts organizations, boys and girls clubs, YMCAs, mental health organizations, college prep. Nevera College is one of our biggest community supporters. Corsicana is really built on a community partnership and how we want to raise these children to love their community, take care of their community, and to come back and be a part of the Corsicana community as a whole. Nothing is, is better to us than to see a, a third generation child come back and be a doctor or a lawyer or especially a teacher here in Corsicana ISD. So I graduated in 2009 from Corsicana High School. I was actually salutatorian of my class. I put your, I put your alphabet in order. Okay, lay it, okay, lay it out on your table, and then you can be, you can be hands on, on and, answer and answer the question. A kid will, a kid work, will work hard for you if they know that you care. So I try so to build those relationships first. I think, I think it's important to let the kid, to let the kid know that I care about them as a kid. You're not just, You're not a, just number. a number. Um, um, I care about, I care like about your growth, like, your growth, like, like we talked about. Hey, I don't, hey, I don't care, care if you're making a hundred. I want to see that you're getting better every day. So I think that the kids, if they know that you care, they're going to work hard for you. I think all the teachers here care. Chrissy can I see really prepares you for the future and the classes that they offer to students. Um, they offer the Navarro College courses. They offer um, the pathway courses that get you ready for what you want to do in the future after you graduate high school. So classes such as pre-med, the veterinarian classes, automotives, welding, theater, whatever you want to do, I'm sure there's a class for it here. I would say that Christina and I see the most successful thing we've done for our students, both within the classroom and outside of the classroom. Our program is like our Penguin Project. Um, that really engages students extracurricularly, no matter their ability level. And, and then the in the classroom, uh, not only do we, do we have a tremendous, a tremendous amount of hours that our inclusion teachers come in, we give them as much time as possible, but we also have a program of peer coaches where students serve in those roles to support their peers. I'm proud of my district and my school because they always uh, make everyone feel included. And like, even though there is diversity in it, everybody has a place that they can belong and feel welcome. So last night was pretty great. Um, it's a district award. People have congratulated me, and I say it is not about me. It is about our district. And when I was talking last night, I talked about people at every at, at every um, job description. And so it's about what Corsican ISD is and what we stand for and our belief in our kids. And so I just want to thank everybody in the district and our community for, for their support. And I want to especially thank HEB for recognizing public education in this way. Thank you very much. And that was a honestly a wonderful night last night, and it's truly inspiring to see what HEB does for our community. So uh, my hats off to everyone involved in this, and we couldn't. Have, it's a take, it takes a tribe, right? And uh, we definitely have have shown people that Corsicana is, is ISD is doing some great things. Can I just say one thing? If if you wonder where you want to shop. You want to shop HEB? Yeah. Um, and last night proved that in the first 10 minutes. They gave away $10,100,000 to Uvalde in the first 10 minutes. So to me, that was enough right there. But if you consider where to shop, I would encourage HEB just because of their commitment to the community and, and public education for sure. We're going to move on to the appraisal district report. We've asked uh, Father Monk to come up here and as our representative for the school board um, to talk about upcoming changes to some of the taxes and appraisal values. All right. Mr. President, Dr. Frost, it's good to be here even on this side of the of the dais for a second. Congratulations on your award. That's awesome. I'm so proud to see that last night. Let me start off with a caveat right quick. It would be illegal and an offense under the Texas property tax code if you tried to influence the amount of property assessment uh, for Navarro County. So don't do that. 
Uh, don't do that at all. I'll try to give you what knowledge I can about the way that the system works, uh, but you would be guilty of a felony if you tried to uh, influence the chief appraiser or the appraisal district in their operation of how they assess uh, the value of the county. <clears throat> so just brief history, and this is going to go a lot faster than the amount of paper suggests. Uh, brief history, 1979, the, the legislature passed a bill called the Pivoto Bill, which centralized appraisal processes throughout the state of Texas. Everyone will know, if you have memory back that far, that before then, every taxing entity conducted their own appraisals. Uh, and the stories are legendary about how people that were long-term members of certain taxing entities were able to lower their appraisals because their taxing entity did their own appraisal. So, I mean, you, can, you know the stories, right? You, you've all heard them. So, uh, 79, they required that all taxing entities, that all taxing entities use one standard, one central appraisal district in each county. So, there are 254 appraisal districts throughout the state. Uh, and so, what happened then is that you got that, and then you got some of the things that uh, I think are vexing us today. I mean, they're important, but they, they cause all the people to get their hair on fire. Uh, the required notices about your your appraised value, the estimate of your of your taxes for the year, uh, the fact that you have to have an open meeting when you approve your tax rate, you have to have public hearings on that, and all those things that you do now out of course, all that happened in 1979. Uh, the whole system was, was changed at that point. And then of course in, in 2019, you had SB2, which capped the percentage uh, that you're actually able to collect on. Note, there's no percentage cap on how much your appraisal can go up. There's only a percentage cap on how much the taxing entities can claim of that, right? So we can, the, the appraisal district, your appraisal can go up 100%, but the school district could only claim 2.5% of that appraisal as new taxes, except for newly constructed property, which goes on the books at the full value every year. So that's a, that's a separate category. So what happens then is that starting on January the 1st of each year uh, through the first quarter of the next year, that is the 15-month appraisal period that the chief appraiser uses uh, to do the work that they need to do. Why 15 months? That gives you a little bit of wiggle uh, on sales and looking at how sales are trending because you'll see in a minute that that is uh, very important. So what they do, of course, is that they look for uh, sales data uh, of, of what's going on within the community, uh, except for foreclosures. So those don't get included uh, because they're typically low. Uh, so that's their first starting point is they look for uh, sales data. Uh, and you can see on page two then, uh, you get, if you, if you buy a house, you're gonna get a letter uh, that says, how much did you pay for your house? You're not obligated to respond. Right, it's not, it can't be mandatory in the state of Texas. Uh, but th they may see a closing statement. Uh, they may see information from brokers. Uh, they may see something on the MLS or the CoStar, which says uh, these houses sold in Corsicana for this much. That all builds the database of information about how much uh, your house is worth. And then, of course, they have to appraise physically your house every three years. There has to be a new appraisal done on it uh, every three years. And the way that, that they're instructed to do the appraisal or to come up with the appraised value is what they call a ratio study. So the ratio is the appraised value, sorry, not plus, that should be divided by the sales price. Appraised value divided by the sales price. And so if you do that, uh, the, the target ratio is one. Right, we want to have a ratio of one there. So, if you bought your house for X amount of dollars, then you need to understand that that's a fair appraisal of your house. If you say, I wouldn't sell my house for more than this amount, that's a fair appraisal for your house. If you told your insurance it costs this much money to rebuild my house because I want, you know, I want to have that kind of insurance rather than just loss, that's a fair appraisal on the value of your house, right? So that, that's the way it works. They're looking for number one. Uh, that number one as the ratio there. Uh, so a fee appraisal of your house is another way. I mean, if you do a fee appraisal on a mortgage and say, I need to borrow 550,000 for this house, that's a fair appraisal of your house. And so everybody always wants to think that, no, uh, it should be less on this, you know, it should be exactly the same 
uh, on both appraisals or at least within a, uh, a percentage. So whatever you think your house, uh, you would sell your house for is a pretty good idea of what your appraisal should be. Uh, and then you have a pretty good basis um, on which to, uh, to fight for that. So that, that gives you some idea of, of what it is that they're looking at. And if you look at the chart on page three, you can see where we have a problem. And so the gray line there, uh, and it didn't come out very well, is the appraisal level. And the red line is the market trend. Those two lines, if you're using a ratio, should never intersect. And the fact that we had an intersection of those lines back in the second quarter of 2001 told us that we had a big problem because the market trend was going up but our appraisals were actually decreasing. Those lines should always be parallel and going in the same direction. So this is why, this is why when they noticed that there was a big uh, problem right there. So you had uh, several reasons of what caused that but uh, number one was there was very inadequate classification of property uh, and the chief appraiser and the interim chief appraiser at that time did not update the cost schedules in the appraisal system, right? What happened in 2020, 21, and 22? Building costs went up. So if you don't update the building cost in the system, you get a bad appraisal. I mean, that's just, that's just the way that you're going to do it. Uh, the, the former system that was in place in Navarro County was that each appraiser was assigned an area and they appraised the same area over and over and over again. So if you, uh, if you had one appraiser that always went low, that area was going to get low appraisals. If you had one that went high, that area was going to get high appraisals. That's been uh, corrected and I'll tell you about that in a moment. And then, of course, you had an historic real estate market never before seen uh, the way in which uh, people were bidding on houses. So the, that creates a problem only, and I'll, I'm, this is important for you, for the board, this creates a problem only for schools. It's not a problem for cities, it's not a, a problem for counties, it's not a problem for colleges. It only creates a problem for school districts. And the reason for that is because you as a school district are subject to a property value study. And the reason you're subject to a property value study is because you get state money. Cities, counties, they don't get state money, so they don't do this property value study. And so the purpose of this is they, this is what, this is done by the um, comptroller, uh, by the, the fund group called the Property Tax Assistance Division. Uh, so they do this uh, property value study. And what they do, so we take a 15 month period the state takes an 18 month period. So they'll go six months after, or three months after the year and three months before the year, and they'll come up with their own number of what they believe the assessed property value should be in Navarro County. And they, they send that number in to uh, TEA. So, uh, and there's a, I gave you a separate handout which you can read about that. Uh, but what happens is that School districts have to fall within what is known as the confidence interval. School district's property value has to come within 95 to 105 percent of the number that the state comes up with. And if, if, if Navarro County Central Appraisal District has gotten you a number that's below that or above that, then you go into what's called grace period. And so that means you will have another property value study the next year. If you make it, if you make it like Course Canada ISD did in 2021, then you get a year off. So you're going to have a property value study this year uh, on your appraised values. If you don't make it, you go into grace period. You get grace period year one. If you don't make that, you go to grace period year two. If you don't make that, they say, oh, TEA, you must use the numbers that we, the state of Texas, give you uh, for their property tax. And I guarantee you they're not going to fudge on something that's too low. They're going to take it when you're... Uh, generally too high, but in, in our case here in Navarro County, they've, they've been too low. But they're, so uh, that's going to result in them saying, you've been taking too much money from us, uh, the state. So we're going to cut back uh, on your state revenue uh, by however much we need to cut back. So for instance, uh, Currens is currently in year two of grace. Uh, we don't know that they're going to be out of grace whenever the next property value study comes. 
they will lose approximately 10% of their budget uh, if that happens. Uh, so um, anyway, that just kind of gives you an idea uh, of, of what, is, what is going on. So I, I, there's, let me say this too. There's 254 appraisal districts in Texas. Currently 175 of them have school districts that are in some sort of grace period uh, with, with uh, the comptroller. So uh, it's, not, it's not an unusual problem uh, whenever you have that. So remember that you've got to be within 95 to 105 percent of whatever number, magic number, uh, the comptroller comes up with. It has nothing to do with anything that we appraised your house on. They do their, whatever magic they do with their things, that's what they uh, come up with. So I gave you the four uh, that are out, the, the, all four districts in Navarro County are in year two of grace. Uh, and so we've got our fingers crossed uh, that when the 2023 studies come out that they'll be back within the confidence interval, otherwise there's, there's going to be a problem. So. You see that uh, that Bloom and Grove on page five, uh, they're out by 10 percent. So they are they are they are well below where they should be uh, in terms of the of the. So they their local test value on page six. This is what they what we reported 347 million. The state said the lowest Bloom and Grove should be is 362 million. And so that was beyond the the confidence interval for them. Uh, Kearns, uh, if you look over on page eight, uh, we were 450, we had them at 457. The state said, no, the lowest you should be is 462. They were outside of the confidence interval on the low end, also. Uh, way low. The same thing in Mildred and the same thing in Rice. Okay, nobody is, nobody is over. Nobody is over it. And I'm just going to tell you the sad part about that is that those numbers are low and they had a 38% increase in their appraised value last year. I mean, all, countywide, the appraised value was increased 38% and they were still coming in low. So uh, that, that doesn't make anybody at the appraisal district very popular. Uh, I can tell you that. So when you go to Corsicana, uh, on page 13 for, for 2021, uh, which you passed, but when you look at the numbers, keep your fingers crossed. Uh, because you were uh, 1,509,000 uh, was your local test value, but the lower limit was 1,502. So, I mean, you passed by a hair. I mean, $7 million, but that's a hair when you're talking about billions. Uh, so we want to make sure, hopefully, you know, that we are, that we are there. Now, there, there's one other dangerous part about this property value study that you should know. There is no appeal. If you are out of compliance the first year, nothing you can do about it. If you're out of compliance the second year, there's nothing you can do. About it. You can't go to them and say, oh, here's the situation. Here's, they don't care. You go to, if, if you get your money taken away the third year, then you can appeal. But if you called up Linebarger tomorrow and said, hey, we're out of the confidence ratio on our property value study, they say, sorry, there's not a thing we can do. They say, if you get to the third year, we'll come defend you like crazy. Year one and year two, we can't do anything to help you. After they take the money. After the, yeah, after. They take the money first. They take, yes, and then you can appeal and hopefully they'll give it to you back. But there, there's nothing you can do. TEA does not like this rule. Uh, but. There, there is absolutely no appeal uh, to year one and year two. How long could it take to keep that number? That's a good question, isn't it? So, uh, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and so, uh, PTAD will tell us that they don't force us to raise property values, but they do, right? Because they send us these property value surveys and say, oh, your, your districts are out of compliance. Well, okay, well, I mean, I can't say that they did that, but. That's exactly what uh, what they did. So that's that's what you're that's what you're facing um, this year. You're facing that uh, 2023 property value study. Uh, I hope I hope that with what what they've been doing, uh, that there will be um, that there will be plenty of uh, plenty of room. Now let me just say real quick, and then I'm happy to answer lots of questions if I know the answer. Uh, if I don't, I'll make something up. Uh, but um, the, um, 
So the way that that's being addressed, I mean, as you know, we have a new chief appraiser, uh, Bud Black, who came in from Freestone County, was there for 40 years, uh, knows, knows what he's doing, uh, knows what he's doing. So the, the two main things that, that they have done down there to address the problem is, number one, the appraisers don't work solo anymore. Now they work as a team. So if you look on page 15, we have a map uh, that we've approved. This is every three years we have to have a, an appraisal plan. And so this is our appraisal plan for the next three years. And we're starting with Corsicana B. Uh, so it may mean, it may mean for your uh, 75110 residents that next year they're going to get another big increase uh, because all, all the properties in Corsicana will be reappraised this year. Uh, so they're, you're going to get another brand new appraisal uh, this year. Uh, and then year A, we're going to do uh, the west side of the county. And year C, we're going to do the east side of the county. Uh, but they're all working together now. They all have to be able to defend each other's work. They all have to know why uh, somebody gave somebody else this appraisal uh, and what happened. So that, that makes a huge, huge difference uh, in how they're doing it. The other thing is that they've now... Uh, part of the big jump that you're seeing now is that the cost schedules have been updated in the appraisal software to actually reflect what it costs and a lot of differentiation has been made. I mean, is there a difference between a wood frame house and a brick house? Yes, there is. Uh, is there a difference between a house with uh, wood studs and a house with steel studs? Yes, there is. Is there a house, difference between a house with a metal roof and a shingle roof? A slate, all those things now are being taken into consideration um, as opposed to just saying the way that they had it set up before, they just said house, right? And then they would try to manually adjust for what they thought were the improvements to the house. And that created these uh, really low values uh, along the way. The other thing that we're doing uh, to really remedy a lot of this is, believe it or not, there's some shady people out there when it comes to uh, appraisals. Uh, and so uh, the state law does not allow an appraiser to go or look into your backyard uh, without your permission. Can't go behind a lock gate. Uh, so a lot of big houses out at the lake, other places that have gates, we don't know what they have there. Uh, so we now have a contract where we fly over uh, multiple times a year uh, and take pictures. And we added about $100 million to the property values this year just by what we saw on the pictures. You'd be surprised how many people added on to the back of their houses, closed in garages, put in pools, uh, did all kinds of things, but didn't let an appraiser come back to see that. Uh, and so that, that value was being uh, hidden uh, from all of you and, and from all of us. So. The bottom line is they're working as hard as they can, uh, but as you well know, uh, the appraisal district does what the appraisal district does. They set a property value. That's it, right? I mean, they, they have nothing to do with taxes. In fact, they're not even allowed to talk to people about taxes. I mean, we may collect some of your homesteads or whatever else and, and put them on file, but if you've got a problem with your tax bill, you've got to go talk to Mike Dowd because uh, he's the tax assessor collector. Uh, so that's, I mean, that's, that's, where that, that's where that goes. But they're, they're working very hard, uh, and it's, a, it's actually a pretty complicated deal, uh, all things considered. But it really, it is the school districts that uh, bear the burden because you get that extra level of scrutiny uh, on, your, on your property values. So uh, I'm going to answer any questions you might have for me. Yeah, Ed, I have a question. So it, it's been asked of us at times, can we lower our rate? Um, and House Bill 3 sets the rate for, this, for us, but could, if we could physically lower our rate below that figure that House Bill 3 gives us, can we do that? I mean, I think I know the answer. I mean, I don't, I'm obviously I know the answer, but... I would have to answer not as a member of the appraisal board, but I mean, I, I have a feeling that you can't uh, based on my experience as a school board member. But the other thing you should, we always have to remember is that there's an inverse relationship between appraisals and effective tax rates. So the higher your appraisal is, the lower your effect, your lower your tax rate has to go, right? So you're going to be lowering, especially INS. You're going to be lowering INS rates. You're going to be lowering taxes as an offset to the appraisal. It's it's a it has to happen. That's you know that's the law. Mike can't collect any more uh, on INS than than he's allowed to, uh, and. So, I mean, that, that, there is that inverse relationship that happens always. And the city will probably lower its tax rate a penny or something based on the higher valuations. That's, I mean, that's what, what good, responsible leaders do. 
uh, but if you have a if you have a floor, you can't go under the floor. I mean, it's it's just not allowed. We we've lowered every year I've been on the board, so I mean. Yeah. The, the the other thing to note, of course, is that nobody ever starts with a zero tax rate. You cannot start with a zero tax rate. You don't build from there because you've already got obligations. I mean, you're obligated to so much already. You could never start with a a zero in there. You want to, you'll, I know you'll do your best to keep it as low as you can, but you can never start with a zero. That's a huge fallacy to say that it starts at zero because it, it can't start at zero, right? I mean, there's things you are mandated to do by law as a school district. Provide a good education to children. So you can't start at zero. There's no way. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, I mean, it, it is, I understand that, I mean, and I, I mean, I, I guess thank you for letting me be on this board because the last couple of weeks have been fun, you know, when people get all their cards in the mail, but, you know, I, I mean, I understand that and people just, I mean, I understand people don't want to pay more taxes and, you know, and it makes it hard to pass a bond when appraisals go up and uh, it, there's, there's a chain reaction to everything, but we were so far behind. We were so far behind where we should have been. We're, we're, we're really lucky that those four districts and even ours is just now dodging that bullet, hopefully. Uh, it happened in South Lake a few years back, you might recall, and uh, it, was a, it was a disaster. I mean, the only thing you can do is what? Lay off people. Uh, that's the only thing you can do. Uh, so, you know, we've got to let the process play out until it gets to where it should be. So do you, um, given, this is incredible information. I, I did not know very, this before. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Um, given your experiences on the board and what you see if you're going to look into the future, how long do you think that that progression might take for us to catch up? I think you'll, I think when we get our 20, so April of 24, let's see, April of 24, 75110 is going to get their bad postcards in the mail from this reappraisal. 25 that's going to be the year that not much happens for Corsicana. So everybody, everybody else will be going pulling their hair out. But uh, Corsicana, that's when the, the pressure will be off. Well, so yeah, and as, assuming that the, the, the real estate market stabilizes, which it looks like it is, uh, you know, so if we get those, air, those lines back to parallel, uh, there can be a gap. But we, if we get them back to parallel, then you'll be good. Uh, you won't be seeing that kind of crazy stuff going on. So 38% increase last year is probably going to be like a 25% increase this year uh, across the county. I think the estimate I heard was we're going to add $3 billion to the um, total county appraised value this year. So a lot of that's new stuff, but a lot of that's also just in, uh, increased appraisals. So, yeah, it's... Yeah, it's, it's, you know, very interesting. There's one more, the other thing I forgot to say back in the other part was one of the big jobs that the appraisal district does is it defends, it defends the school district against lawsuits all day, every day. Now, there's currently 18 active litigations against Corsican ISD that the appraisal district is defending you uh, against. When people get unhappy about their taxes, they sue the appraisal district. Uh, and so that's where most of that money that you budget for them goes, really, uh, is... Because you get a, you get someone who's a lawyer and they don't have to pay themselves, and then they sue the appraisal district, and we wind up spending you know thirty, forty thousand dollars defending a case uh, that's going to generate four thousand dollars maybe at the end of the day. So it's yeah, one of those crazy things. Brother Mott. Very good information. You're, You're welcome. Thank you so Invite me back anytime to talk about it. I'll be happy to. Thank, thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you. Appreciate you being on that board for us. Yeah. You're welcome. All right. Presentation on the summer learning plans. <coughs> Good evening. Good evening. Can you hear me? I can talk loud. Okay. Good evening. 
Good evening, uh, Mr. President, Dr. Frost, and distinguished members of the board. Uh, this evening, I'm here to present our summer learning plans, which we have quite a variety of options this summer we're very excited about. Uh, we have a variety of things from credit recovery to attendance recovery to acceleration to enrichment and just things that are really grounded in fun and learning and exploration. So the first thing I'm going to start with is the continued summer learning for our pre-K kindergarten, which is Bilingual and EL Academy. It will be located at Fannin Elementary. Ms. Geeslin will be overseeing that particular academy. Uh, it will start on May the 31st. All teachers will have a teacher prep day on May 30th, and it will run through June the 23rd. The times for those academies will be from 7.30 to 3.30, and it will run Monday through Friday for the bilingual EL pre-K kinder. First through fourth grade, we're very excited to be able to offer for a second summer, um, the, the summer learning for first and second. Um, third and fourth grade, and so this is something that has been helped uh, being funded by our ESSER um, grant, so that's been nice. Uh, there will be literacy and math acceleration. Ms. Gist will be overseeing that particular summer learning, um, also at Fannin. Dates will be um, roughly the same, but it will end on Thursday, June 22nd, and it will run from 8 to 3.30 um, through the month of June. Fifth and sixth grade will be doing uh, credit and attendance recovery at Collins Intermediate School. Dates are the same. Miss um, Christine Covington will be overseeing our academy for the Corsicana um, at Collins Intermediate School. Seventh and eighth grade will be at the high school this year as they have in the, the past couple of years. Mr. Matthew Berry will be overseeing the credit and attendance recovery there. Dates will also be the same, 8 to 3.30, Monday through Thursday at the high school. And then at the high school, we will be doing two things. We do our credit and attendance recovery, but in addition, we do our STAR Blitz, which happens two weeks before the STAR EOC retesting dates. Ms. Tracy Griggs will be overseeing our credit and attendance recovery, as well as Mr. Zamilpa will be overseeing our STAR Blitz, which is right before the retesting. STAR EOC retests will take place June 20, 20th through June 22nd. Um, teachers will also have a prep day for this particular um, summer learning, and then it will run from 8 to 3.30 during the month of June. Camp Curiosity will be returning this year. We're very excited about this. Um, the registration actually opened today. Um, I'm excited to see the response. We are very, very excited this year to announce the addition of our Little Tiger Cub Camp. That will be um, for kindergarten and first grade students, and they will be able to come the same dates that the other students are coming, and they will be doing an infusion of all the things that the other camps are. So they'll be doing some art, they'll be doing STEM, they will be doing theater, dance, and all the things that the, the other students are doing in the other camps. And the dates for um, Camp Curiosity are June 26th through June 29th. So we'll run from all of our summer learning right into our summer enrichment. So there will be no overlaps of these dates so students can attend actually both, which we're very excited about that as well. So all K through 8th grade students will be a part of Camp Curiosity. Um, and then our high school students are helpers throughout the academy um, at different levels in the different classrooms. And so we kind of have all kiddos are helping with this. Um, Curiosity is obviously our um, driving force in this particular camp. It was proven to be very successful. Students were doing our core content skills, but they were doing it through areas that they were passionate about. And so I put a few pictures in here this year just to kind of oversee uh, what was happening last year. We will be doing our elementary and secondary floral and craft creations. This year, secondary is doing um, a 6-8 floral and craft creation. We only did that for elementary last year, but this year we're going to expand that one up through eighth grade. One of the reasons for that was because we have students that go into floral design at the high school and it's very, very popular. So we don't want there to be a gap in that. So starting in second grade all the way through eighth grade, they'll be able to do floral and craft design. We will also return with our culinary. This is for second through fifth graders. These are pictures of the students from last year. They had an absolute blast um, and they created lots of yummy food. And so that will continue this summer. We will also do elementary STEM and secondary STEM and they will continue doing exploration through um, space as well as doing our series circuits. Uh, they created light up art and um, they absolutely loved it. It was a super fun time. So we will continue with elementary STEM and secondary STEM. And secondary STEM did a lot with velocity, force, and motion. They launched rockets and they did lots of fun, active things throughout the uh, week at secondary STEM camp. So we'll continue that this summer as well. 
And then we're super excited. We have uh, decided on our uh, theater group this year is going to be doing the 101 Dalmatians mini version, and it's also a musical. And so with that, our kindergarten and first grade students in the Little Tiger Cub Camp will be learning the songs and participating in the show and the production on the final day. So it will have all K through 8th grade students in the actual performance. So that is exciting. Uh, we will also continue with our art camp. That is for our two through, uh, second through fifth grade. And then we will also do our sixth through eighth grade, oh, excuse me, sixth through eighth grade um, art will be continuing this summer as well. And then finally, 6th uh, through 8th grade does a photography and videography camp that was super, super popular last year. Uh, we had an award-winning photo photograph that came out of this camp, and so we are really excited to relaunch this particular area for the 6th through 8th grade students. Once Camp Curiosity rounds up, we have a very exciting camp that's going to launch, which is called Jumpstart, and Ms. Howell is going to talk to you a little bit about the Jumpstart Academy. So Margie Crow and Casey Gordon are helping plan uh, Jumpstart. So what Jumpstart will look like, it'll start July the 10th through July the 27th, uh, Monday through Thursday for three weeks prior to school starting from 8 a.m. to 12 p.m. We'll focus on math and reading. They'll also have a PE teacher and an art teacher, so they'll get to have all the fun things as well. They'll have breakfast and lunch. And if they go, if they're 100% attendance on the 28th, they'll attend Kazania in Frisco. It's a where they can go have a really fun field trip. It's teak space. They can pretend to be doctors and engineers and all the other things like that. Um, there's an optional extended day. It's from 12 to 5 p.m. So parents will have the choice to let their kids stay throughout the end of the day. And we're going to have, we're partnering with CTE, um, Culinary Arts, Welding, Ag, um, Automotive, Calico's Choir Band, and every day they'll have a look into something new. So Todd Jones is going to come in. He's actually going to bring in his, uh, his cars that he works on and give them that exposure for that and so every day they'll see something do new if they stay for the 12 to 5 and it's $25 per week for the parent and so they can keep their student there until they um, end their day at, at work at 5 o'clock. I think that's it. Any questions for me? One thing I want to add is we called it Jumpstart because it's not for students who are remediating. Right. It is for if you're going to be in first grade next year then you go into first grade. You go into the grade level that you're going into, and it's supposed to give you a jump start on the things that you'll be learning that school year, give you a strong foundation, and get you started. Yep. Thank you. And we do have to say, Debbie Cotter originated this several years ago, and um, she just needs to give, we need to give credit where credit is due. Yes, she's pretty awesome. Are there any questions? So for the camps, um, the parents can go online to register for those? Yes, ma'am. So they're um, at the uh, Course Can ISD website. There is a link for registration. I believe Jumpstart is going to start up in just a little bit. Is it today? Okay, perfect. So both are active and, and ready for registration. So, yes, sign up soon. Very cool. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Mr. Doring, Mr. Bulwer on the CTE staffing request. Good evening, Dr. Frost, Dr. Brown, board members. Tonight I'm going to talk about uh, a few CT uh, teacher requests. In doing so, though, I'm going to kind of talk about some of the new requirements that, that uh, we're being held to with CTE, CCMR, things like that. I want to start by kind of sharing our projected enrollment for next year. Uh, we're projecting 1,759 students this year. We're at 16, that number is probably a little low. We're a little higher than that right now. So we are going to go up some, just, just so we have that in mind. Um, so there's five, there's five ways to earn your CCMR point, accountability point, through college readiness, and then there's five in career. So, so real quick, I'm going to kind of go through those just so, so you can kind of understand how to earn a CCMR point in college through the college direction. So if you meet the requirements of both reading and math on SAT, ACT, or TSI, then or complete a college prep course, then you can get that point. And we highlighted complete college prep course because next year we are going to try to add these college prep courses. Um, basically, it's a course that a senior can go through if they're having trouble uh, passing their TSI. 
it's a way for us to get the point and for them to go through a, a college prep course. It's online and we'll, we'll run those through our um, computer labs. Another way is get a three or higher on any AP exam. You can get a four or higher on any IB exam, uh, which is really hard and uh, uh, we, we don't have that very often. Uh, you get three hours in ELA or math in dual credit or nine hours in any subject area in dual credit. And you can get your point. If you earn an associate degree by August 31st, immediately following your high school graduation, then you can also get your point. You can also get it by qualifying for three hours of college credit on on-ramps courses. We don't have on-ramps courses, so we kind of grade that out. You can also get your point through career side, and that's kind of what we're kind of talking about tonight. Uh, if you earn an IBC with an aligned program of study, uh, you can get your, your uh, point. And I'm, I'm going to go over the changes and how that changed in just a second. You can also, if you're a current special education senior with at least one endorsement, you can get your point. If you're a graduate code 54 55, which is also on special education, uh, you can get your point. If you earned a level one or level two certificate, you can get your point. Or if you enroll in the military and you have a DD4 form, you can get your point that way. So, changes. Here's how they've changed it. This year, our seniors, if they, if they earn an IBC, which is all you have to do is pass a test to earn an IBC, you can get that point. And you can... Why do you want a point? Because it's accountability. So we're held accountable by how many, by how many CCMR points we get. It's a big part of our accountability. Yes, IBC is an industry-based certificate. So it's an industry-based certificate, which before you could, you could come into high school and you could take several different CTE courses. They didn't have to be aligned with your certificate. You could just come in and like at this time of year you could have students take different tests and if they pass that test and they got the certificate. So you could load up on tests. And so I think the state saw that and it's really not the intent. They really want you to go through a program and know the ins and outs and really earn the certificate. So next year's uh, seniors, they have to earn an I IBC by passing the test and they have to take a level two aligned course. And then class of 2025, have to, ha they have to earn an IBC by passing the test and they have to be a concentrator, which means they have two or, they have two or more courses in that uh, field of study and they have two or more credits. And then by 2026, and they kind of phased this in, and that's our freshmen this year, uh, by the way, you have to earn an IBC and you have to be a completer, which means you have to take three or more courses, have four more credits with at least a level, uh, at least one level three or four course. So kind of how we've prepared for this is one thing we did is we went to the middle schools this year when they signed up for classes and we talked about this with them because it's really important that they pick a field of study that they're interested in and they can stick with. So uh, that's kind of how we're having to reteach the students. Because before, you could jump around to different CTE courses and then get your certificate at the end. It didn't matter. But now it matters. So those are some of the changes. And you all know about funding and you know about CTE funding, but I wanted to throw it up there just so you get 1.1% funding for CTE courses, not in our approved program of study, which we have some. Uh, money, manners, uh, money matters, interior design, accounting. You get 1.28 for levels one and two CT courses in an appro approved program of study, and I included some there. And they get 1.47 for levels three and four CT courses in an approved program of study. That includes, and I want to talk about floral design, advanced culinary, automotive technology, and some others. One, and I just added this at the bottom, we made one change for next year. Uh, we're changing our yearbook classes to practicum and graphic design and illustration classes, which will produce an extra $56,000 in funding uh, because it's changed into a CTE course. So they're still going to do the same thing, but you change the name of the course. They have more requirements in there, but it, it, it fits more with CTE, and it's just another way you get that experience uh, in a different course. So we created that, and then... So floral design, and that's one of the things I'm going to ask you about today is floral design qualifies for 1.47% funding. This year we have 130 students 
next year we have 240 scheduled requests for floral design. And that's, that's and we can still, and uh, our art classes will still be full, and we still have 240 scheduled requests for floral design. So that's an addition of 110 students in floral design, which will generate approximately $158,000 in CTE funding. So here's what, now I'm going to get to the part what we're asking for. Uh, part of the floral design uh, piece is we, we really need, we feel like we need another ag teacher. And we did some research and just kind of looked around at some of the surrounding schools and their membership and how many ag teachers they have servicing their kids. So you can see that. And uh, so the first request we have is a floral design teacher. We had 237 course requests. We can only serve 150 with what we have now. So, um, in the last two years, FFA scholarships have paid out over $200,000. So, what, basically what we're asking is for a full-time floral design teacher. And what this will allow us to do is the teacher who's teaching floral design right now will still have to do some floral design sections because of the number. But it will also allow her to open up her schedule, maybe not next year, but the year after, to reach to help us get some of these completers. And we can let her work in the um, animal science pathway to help us have more kids in that and help us have more completers. So that's what that would allow us to do. Uh, and that's the uh, floral design teacher. We're also asking for a culinary czar. Hey, I did not talk to Kim about the summer deal. How this worked out with culinary arts and me and JP were laughing. It just kind of happened that way. But uh, culinary arts is also very popular at the high school. We currently have two teachers and basically what this chart says is we need 24 periods to service the kids who have signed up for culinary arts. And it shows you intro, culinary arts one, advanced culinary, and practicum. So we need 24 sections and uh, we have two culinary arts teachers presently. We're asking for an additional one to service those students. And you know, we, we've moved in the past. There's a little more flexibility because if a student's asking for that and you, know, you just move them into another path. Well now, if you do that, you're moving them, you could be moving them for the long haul. Like you can't, so like ideally within the next three or four years if we can be staffed to, to support all the students in those paths all the way through. So also automotive. We currently have one automotive teacher. We have one teacher who, who does some welding, uh, Mr. Jones, and some automotive. Uh, so we have one full-time automotive. Uh, we're asking for one additional uh, automotive teacher. We've, uh, we have 15 sections. Again, we've talked about here. Um, also space is a deal, and we've kind of um, worked out space. Uh, one of the things we're going to do in the auto shop is we have a classroom built in there. They'll have to, you know, you'll either be out there with the cars and stuff or you'll be in the classroom and they'll have to share that space. Uh, but we've worked to have new floral design classroom uh, out there in the CTE building where we're going to move someone around. And so we're, we're finding space for these teachers also. All right, any questions? So on the floral design, I'm just trying to figure out, I know that, are the kids looking at, looking at it like it's an easy, an easy like career? It serves. Yeah, it serves two purposes. First of all, you have to get a fine arts credit in high school to graduate. Uh, you can get in choir. Um, you can get in art. Uh, you can get in floral design, and you can get in. I'm, I'm missing one. Band. 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 Theater. Theater. Okay. So so basically, a student if they're not in band, theater, or choir, they're going to choose between floral design and art. Well, some people just they they fear art because they're not they, they don't want to they're not creative so they they go to floral design so um, it's it's always been more popular I think now in the past though we've had to steer kids into other stuff because we can't service that many kids but that's the popularity of it it's just they, they're gonna get their arts degree I mean they need the fine arts credit so they get I mean they have to take it I guess I just are we trying to build a, floor, a, a good floor design program, like, you know, like, you know, stuff or, you know, like that? Yeah, well, yes, but it's, um, if, 
yes, I mean, we would love for students to get interested in that by taking that and, and go in that direction. Um, but honestly, it's, it's a way, it's a way to, uh, to increase funds also. And we don't push kids like they, you know, they, they do this course request and they decide, um, but they like that class. It's a hands-on class. It's, you, you don't have to be an artist. You don't have to be able to draw. You don't, you know, it's just, you know, you learn a, you learn a trade, you learn, you learn something, and it's, I think it's a fun class, honestly. Any other questions? Um, Thank you. I do. I have a question. Oh, I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah, sorry. I'm sorry. Okay, so you said yearbook is changing the name, and that'll bring in CTE credit as well. Yeah. Um, is will that also allow yearbook to be a fine arts credit? No. 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 Yearbook okay. is not a fine arts. No, no ma'am. Okay. So Scott, this is an action item. So we're re asking the board to approve these um, additional FTEs tonight. And while Mr. Johnson's back there, we want to thank him for um, running, um, leading, managing this CTE department. It's growing all the time. I mean, it, uh, career and technology preparation is becoming more and more important every year. So that means his job gets bigger and bigger every year. So thank you to him. He does a great job with this. And um, for Mr. to Mr. Doring for putting all this together, I think it's just important that we understand what our students are asking for, and um, I don't think they're you know really over the top with asking for these additional FTEs. We don't come to you very often and ask for new teachers. And if you approve this, will these um, positions and their the budget, the associated budgets, will be driven into the budget for next year. So I'll entertain a motion if anybody wants to. I move to approve the 2.5 additional FTEs for the Corsicana High School Career and Technology Education. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve the 2.5 additional FTEs for the Corsicana High School Career and Technology Education Department. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say no. Ayes have it and we've approved the additional 2.5 FTEs for the Corsicana High School Career and Technology Education. Right, Mr. Roddy, BSN Sports Proposal. Good evening, Dr. Frost, President Brown, members of the board. Uh, thank you for allowing me to be here today. Uh, my purpose is to inform the board of the athletic department's plans to enter in a five-year reward program with BSN Sports, which includes discounted pricing a $20,000 annual spending allotment from BSN, um, BSN Varsity Brands Impact Program, which includes a first year $15,000 campus browning allotment from BSN Varsity Browns, uh, Brands, a Believe in You video series and digital empowerment journals for our students at a $7,500 value, a Believe in Speaker valued at $7,500. Um, promotional allotment from New Balance in year one, buy one, get one, free or BOGO uniforms. Football estimated value of $15,600. Boys and girls basketball estimated value $6,000. Baseball, softball estimated value $11,000. $40 for a total BOGO amount in year one of $43,440 from New Balance. In addition, there will be a $5,060 additional promo allotment from New Balance in year one. So the total year one promo from New Balance is estimated at $48,500. Um, in years two through five of the agreement, um, there will be a $22,000 a spending allotment from New Balance. So the total estimated value of this proposal is in the amount of $266,500. Any questions? <coughs> on the, uh, sure. Yes, ma'am. What, what does that entail? That could entail anything from windscreens so it's it, it is a branding opportunity so 
opportunities to present your logo, um, call attention to the brand. So it could be anything from a windscreen to window covers to floor mats to flags. Um, they even pitched us on a logoed out golf cart. Uh, so th there's an entire catalog of opportunity um, there for branding opportunities. Varsity Brands is a separate division within BSN that that's all they do. Coach Roddy and I listened to this presentation and it, this is a very generous presentation. It brings a great deal of money into the district. It's it's good for our, our sports programs. We've had a great relationship with Under Armour. They also had an opportunity to come and present and this one um, is significantly uh, more um, profitable and we could save more money. Um, they give us a large range of different brands. Um, we also have somebody in the in who lives in Corsicana who would be our representative. We've loved our Under Armour, Under Armour representative, but um, he doesn't. You know, he doesn't live here in Corsicana. He's been um, very resourceful and helpful for us. But having somebody who lives in Corsicana really does make a difference. I remember years ago, a question we had um, worked with BS. It is an option, and it's in your proposal in your uh, board book, my team shop. So absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I will add too on the on the New Balance piece, uh, just a good piece of information. Um, you know, we would be the only public school in the United States at this particular time um, to be a New Balance school. What is our cycle um, on our uniform? It varies. It's typically in the three to four year range. Okay. <coughs> mm -hmm. Depending, yes, because of the wear and tear. Mm -hmm. But the company's trying to make a commitment to get us into the brand, and they know the expense associated with that. And so that, therefore, the buy one, get one uh, in year one, it, it's a, you know, good for them, good for us. Coach Roddy, what's, what's the uh, projected longevity of New Balance as far as their product? Are they a better product? Are they an Under Armour? Or do we know? That it's, it's all personal preference, but I will say that we were able to put our hands uh, on these products, and it, it's high quality. Um, it wasn't just one or two things. They filled the room up with product. Uh, they filled the room up with uh, people. Um, one of the neat things about it is the uh, nat the um, account representative for New Balance will be servicing the account as well. It will not just be BSN. He is local. He is in Burleson. Um, so he will be hands-on with this account as well as the manufacturer rep with New Balance. And the BOGO is really, I'm assuming those are the more expensive sports to outfit originally. So that doesn't mean that we couldn't get New Balance for tennis or volleyball no, no or man. track. That, that's one of the appealing things of this is that they do offer uh, uniforms, apparel, and all, all the sports that we participate in. In fact, some of it is some of their premier type stuff like New Balance started out as a running shoe company, right? So their track line is phenomenal. They, they have soccer, they have golf, they have tennis. So they have all those things. Any other questions? Um, we can sign the agreement. We wanted the board to be aware um, of this and have all the information. Any of your questions answered? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Coach Wright. Appreciate it. <coughs> All right, the monthly financial update. I'm just quickly going through the financial update. I um, wanted to point out a couple of things on page 10 at the revenue, local and state. We're looking at um, having received 95% of the local revenue and 57% of the state. Um, it looks like we are at about 73.5% of our total um, general fund revenue that we'll be receiving um, 
for during the remainder of our fiscal year. The other important thing, and this is where I always um, kind of look first, is on page 12, which is that if you look at our expenditures by function, we're at, um, a, I see a lot of 50s and 60s there. Um, this time of the school year to be at an average of 66% or two-thirds of our um, expenditures is puts us in, in very good shape. So we look at um, finishing the year with hopefully some money for fund balance. If you have any other questions, I'll be glad to go through that. And um, if you have any really hard questions, Brian will be glad to answer those for you. Does anyone have any questions? All right, thank you, Dr. Frost. All right. We're going to go into closed session as permitted by Texas Governance Code, Section 551.01.